one of the notable uh, trends and deplorable trends, if you will, of the last uh, several years has been uh, the inexorable continuation of the rise of the far right. Uh, and I say continuation because it's been going on for some time, and our next guest has been chronicling it for some time. David Niewert is an investigative journalist based in Seattle and a contributing writer for the Southern Poverty Law Center, which does terrific work. He's a friend of the programs, he's a friend of mine, and his, he is the author of a number of excellent books. Uh, his latest is entitled Alt-America, the Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump. It's out on Verso Books, and he joins us now. Dave, thanks for coming on the program. Always a pleasure, RJ. Yeah, same here, although I have to say the topic is hardly pleasurable. Uh, it's a fascinating book. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic. Did you have any idea, a lot of research clearly went into it, did you have any idea when you began writing this book that it was going to be so timely when it was finally published? No, actually, when I started writing it, you know, we actually had trouble selling it because most of the houses that we talked to were, it didn't believe that they said, they thought it would be a dead topic by this year um, and that it would have gone away because uh, they assumed that Trump was going to lose the election. And, and honestly, I did too. Um, but, you know, my argument always was that even if Trump went away overnight, uh, this phenomenon that it's really about, which is the army of followers that he's raised and the the real surge of right wing extremism that he's helped empower uh, will not be going away anytime soon. Uh, we're going to be dealing with the consequences from that for a very long time. So uh, let me ask you, because you've been covering the, the extreme right, um, and I prefer extreme right to radical right just because uh, I still have a soft spot for radicalism as a left thing, but uh, but ra radical right is, of course, also true. It is, ra you know, it is an extremist position. Um, you've been covering the radical right for a long time, and uh, they've all, it's been there at least since the 90s. I mean, I recall a certain amount of it in the 80s. Um, but how is it, whether quantitatively or qualitatively, how is it different now from the way it was in the 90s or 2000s? Is it the mainstream of it, mainstreaming of it? Is it the social media aspect? Is it all of the above? Plus, uh, what's different about the new radical right? Main thing is the much larger numbers. Um, we just see a lot more people um, being out there and engaged and having been successfully recruited into these belief systems. And yes, it's all of the above. It is the social media. It is the pervasiveness on the internet. It is the, um, uh, you know, all of the various manifestations of it, including the fact that we finally not only did uh, politicians succeed by legitimizing and mainstream but he was actually we'll lose your stream of thought there <laughs> well uh it, it was yeah and we had a little connectivity problem in the middle of it to make that even worse but just giving uh, you a bad time uh, the but here's what we got uh, uh, so here's what we have to contend with then uh, much greater numbers than before. Uh, obviously, a president uh, continuing to tacitly or maybe not so tacitly uh, fuel their enthusiasm. Uh, we saw that after Charlottesville, right? We, uh, Trump, uh, you know, good people on right. both sides. You know, there aren't good people on both sides. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that in and of itself well, is that, a, ra a radical statement, don't you think? That, that was. That was the classic, actually, that was the apotheosis of what we'd been seeing from Trump um, really all throughout the campaign. Uh, this little sort of, we call it a two-step tango that he, he did with um, with the radical right, you know, where Jake Tapper would ask him, well, uh, what about David Duke? And he would refuse to denounce David Duke, and then they would blow up into a, 
uh, a media storm for a day, and then he'd come out the next day and say, oh, no, 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 I d- disavow David Duke, right? And in his, the radical right, the racist right, the, you know, these neo-Nazis and white nationalists on uh, in the alt-right very much saw this as, you know, his sort of um, winking and nudging at them, and they interpreted it in a very, you know, adulatory way. They saw him as, um, this is, these are signals from Trump to them that he was on their side. And that was very much what we saw all throughout the campaign. Um, and he really kind of reached the, it reached its apotheosis when he made those remarks at that press conference about, yeah, some of them are fine people. You know, it's worth pointing out that he was specifically talking about the Friday night Tiki torch rally, mm-hmm. which was not at, <laughs> That was not a, at the uh, around the Robert E. Lee statue. That was a march that actually went to the University of Virginia campus, and really had nothing to do with Confederate monuments. It had to do. It was organized by white nationalist Richard Spencer, and all of his all of those guys that were carrying torches were carrying them at his behest. They were there, and he specifically said this march that night was about something much bigger than just monuments. It's about taking back Western civilization, blah, 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 all the stuff that white nationalists go on about. So so Trump was not only profoundly wrong uh, about that, but he really mischaracterized it. Actually, every, every one of those, and I think there were nearly a thousand of them out that night. If you look at the march, it was quite large. Um, every one of those people was organized under Richard Spencer's white nationalist banner. There is nothing good about those guys. No, if no. You, they, if you want to know the truth of it. Right. There was no, nobody good. Not, not, on no the, very fine people in that crowd. Absolutely not. And by the way, you know, just a side thought, but, but you know, curious as your thoughts on it. To me, you know, I've been in Europe. I've been in Hungary and other places as the radical right emerged and so, reemerged. Uh, to me, when they talk about Western civilization, it is precisely the way Hitler and the Nazis talked about uh, Western civilization as a kind of idealized, all-white... You know, there's a reason why Albert Speer, Hitler's architect, designed all those pseudo-Greco-Roman mon- you know, monumental mm-hmm. buildings and so on. It was the notion that Western civilization is inherently superior because it is white. And that's to me when when the, when the so-called uh, alt right talks about Western civilization, it is to me it's an overtly racist play. I don't know what you think about that, but sure, sure. Well, I mean, they were mar- they were chanting "blood and soil" for God's sakes. Yeah, you can't get any more Nazi than that. <laughs> no, you really can't. That's, that was that was Hitler's slogan for Lebensraum, right? The right. <laughs> You Bluten Bowden, uh, you know, that was their chant. And um, yeah, no, it doesn't really get any. And you will not replace this is also that's a reference to the whole white genocide meme. And I mean, everything about it was just white nationalists all the way through. So but and here's the thing. What I'm more concerned about is that the media is kind of letting him get get away with this to some extent or is, is failing to really notice the, the big elephant in the room. When they talk, you know, they're, they were appalled that he was apologetic to them and that sort of thing. But what they're really missing out on is, is the fact that there, these thousands of white nationalists are organizing under the banner of Donald Trump. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody is, I mean, I, I, I happen to know a hate crimes expert who went on CBS News recently um, a, a good guy, and he said that he told me that he had made several remarks directly connecting the issue of hate crimes to Donald Trump, and he said all of those remarks got edited out. Huh. Um, no one seems to want to review my book. I got a review in the in the Washington Post, but I I haven't been. I mean, even my hometown paper, Seattle Times, is not reviewing it. Um, because nobody wants to talk about the fact that this 
phenomenon is very specifically connected to Trump. Well, you know, that to me, uh, first of all, it makes me doubly glad we're having you on to talk about the book, but, but uh, it also fascinates me because, and disturbs me, because this gets to the whole question of mainstreaming of hate ideas. I'm one who, uh, Dave, you know me, and you know that uh, I'm very, I'm always telling Democrats, you know, go easy on the Hitler comparisons. Don't get too carried away with the Russia story and all that. But the fact is, the mainstreaming of hate and the mainstreaming of fascist ideology or someone who plays to it with a nod and a wink to me is absolutely reminiscent of Germany in the 1930s. There's no two ways about it. That, you know, people, if you read the history uh, of Germany back then, there's, there are a number of good books on it. The story is always, well, you know, he talks a little crazy and he appeals to the nuts out there, but really he just wants to govern uh, rationally. And at the end of the day, yeah, maybe he's a little nutty too, but. Uh, and he makes trains run on time. Yeah, he makes the trains run on. Well, I don't think anyone's saying that about Donald Trump. Um, because no, 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 but you know what I'm yeah. saying. That's, that, they, they, they will excuse it under the uh, banner of, well, you know, this is part of an orderly society. I mean, that's ultimately in what they're actually saying is, well, look at the Wall Street since Trump was elected, right? Um, they'll find some excuse to say, to point to these authoritarian leaders as actually manifesting an orderly society because that's what authoritarians are about. Right. And ultimately, this is about right-wing authoritarianism and its imposition on American democratic society. And, it, you know, there's so many questions I'd love to ask you about this, and, and I guess the short answer for our listeners is read Dave's book, which is uh, Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump. But one of the ones that comes to mind, and I think it's, such an important question is, um, now you say that what uh, Donald Trump has started will live on. So for example, if he gets impeached uh, and he's gone in a year, let's say, as one potential outcome, not, I'm not taking bets, but it's certainly something that could happen. But even if, mm -hmm. it, 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 that could be worse, right? In a sense, it's not a reason not to impeach him, but you could see a guy, if he were, uh, removed from office for high crimes and misdemeanors saying, well, he was victimized by the forces of you know what, you know, in Eastern Europe. Oh, they, Hillary and Obama. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And not only that, then he would call out his army of followers. Yeah. Who are, uh, I should remind everybody, extremely well armed. Yeah, no kidding. And, and so which of these potential futures frightens you the most, David Neewert, the one where Donald Trump serves eight hour, uh, eight, eight years in office, the one where, yeah, is that the scariest one? No, well, that, that's the worst, yeah, but actually the one where he essentially uh, um, disposes with um, the niceties of democracy. Um, there was a poll taken of, um, of voters about four months ago that found that um, the majority of that, a large majority of Trump supporters would be perfectly fine with him uh, suspending the 2020 election if he were able to establish that um, there were there were no that they, uh, voter fraud were occurring on a large scale. This is why Chris Kobach is going to work on yeah. this voter fraud commission. They're going to they're going to uh, put out a report with some phony results in it. And yeah, if, I mean, there, he could, he could do something like that. Uh, I think I would like to think he would need a, a real serious excuse such as um, a nuclear war with North Korea or a terrorist strike of some kind to actually impose, you know, to, to do switch the trigger on that. But we do know that his followers and his believers are perfectly okay with that. No, we d we do know that. So on a uh, you know, and, and of course it would all hinge, at least under in the current situation, on what uh, other Republicans were willing to tolerate, and what the generals, frankly, yeah. would would or were willing to tolerate. But um, on a scale, uh, this is going to have to be the last question. But you're allowed to elaborate briefly. 
uh, on a scale of one to ten, how worried are you about our future? Um, I'm not as panicked as I was election night a year ago. <laughs> I, I drank a whole two thirds of a bottle, fifth of scotch, and I didn't get drunk. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's bad. Yeah, but I didn't get hung over the next day. That's for damn sure. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I've become, I've got more equanimity about it now. I think I certainly feel better after the results of uh, the election. And, and yes, I, I, look, this is the solution. This is the answer. If people want to fight this, organize a vote. Get out the vote. Get all those people who didn't vote in the election out there in the polls. Get all your friends who feel the politics don't affect their personal lives. Remind them that it actually does. Absolutely. And get them out to vote. Uh, because that's what's been missing is this sense of urgency and the sense of understanding that our democracy itself is really at stake. And I truly, deeply believe there are many, many, many thousands more, millions more of us than there are of them. Um, but they have cowed us into a combination of complacency and submission. And we can't allow it anymore. We have to fight back. Uh, we have to stand up for democracy. Um, and the first th step to do that is get out the damn vote. Well, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. As far as a sense of urgency, it's why we call, the, call this show the Zero Hour. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm an optimist. I believe we can beat these guys and have a better democracy than ever. But uh, to do yep. that, we need to know what we're up against. And the book is Alt-America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump by uh, David Neuer. Dave, as always, great to talk to you, and thanks for coming on the show. You bet. My pleasure, Richard.